that as soon as we lose the battle with shaitan one time, two times, three times, we just give up. There's an environmental battle. I mean, like environmental meaning the world we live in today and what they're trying to push on us. So many different battles. And, and to win this battle, you got to be, you, you could say, strategic. When it comes to evil, evil's a river. What are you going to be? You're going to be an unmoving stone. Never try to change one habit at one time. He has to be what I call his body has to be a machine of war. It has to be perfectly fit. And with this perfect fitness, he can engage with that evil. It's like a rematch. Every day is a rematch. Every day is a rematch. And you focus on today. And you're not worried about tomorrow. You're not worried about how you lost yesterday. A soldier of Allah, a man who is on Fatuwa, sometimes he needs just solitude, just detachment from everything. <laughs> So, Salaam Alaikum, everybody. Um, thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, let's start off by doing a quick dua. Sheikh, do you want to quickly do a dua here? To start us off. So today's topic is going to be about Islamic fatwa and the importance of fatwa. Now, a lot of people probably don't know what fatwa means. I mean, I didn't know about it until I learned about it from Sheikh. And it's going to be a very important topic to cover in regards to the times that we live in and the times that we're entering. Really, it comes down to the, the, the development or the personal development of a man and that man reaching closer to his highest potential, if not his highest potential. So this is going to be today's topic, and we believe it's an important topic. The very first step of the four steps, which is fatwa is the first step. Second step is jama'ah. Third step is jihad. And the fourth step is hijra. And once you can really... Okay, no, my, my bad. Uh, but the main thing is if you can develop yourself and increase your level of, you could say, manhood or skill or ability and your mental strength, your mental fortitude, your grit, your character, uh, your akhlaq, everything, you will be more effective when it comes to being in a jama'ah and <laughs> waging the jihad and making the hijra. So let's get started. Uh, Brother Hassan, I know you. Um, have been very dedicated to fitness and I wanted you to give us an introduction about why fitness is important and why we should be doing fitness uh, as a good first step to getting into fatwa. Fitness is a good step for fatwa for multiple reasons. One is that it builds you up as a man. It teaches you strength, discipline, dedication. It teaches you to progress yourself. Through progressive overload, you understand that you have to push yourself harder and harder and harder in life. You have to apply yourself. You can't just be laid back. You can't be lazy in that. It's also that any good soldier is a fit soldier. I've actually seen this very interesting thing where the, um, the U.S. armed forces, they used to have a lot higher standards of fitness. Then they lowered their standards, let women in, they let all this stuff happen. All their standards were going down. And you saw as the morality of the army went down, so did their physical standards. And they got weaker and weaker. But you also saw stuff like, my father, when he went to Syria, he had to do a lot of physical training. In the course of a very short amount of time, he became extremely physically fit, extremely physically strong. Just by training like a soldier would train, by using monkey bars, by pull-ups, by push-ups, by doing these simple things that would increase your athleticism and make you a better soldier, you would better as a fighter. And as a better soldier, more a fighter, you get that discipline, you understand your role. And we as Muslims have to understand our role in society. We have to understand our role in the ummah. We are going to be those who are stones. What do stones mean? When it comes to evil, evil's a river, what are you going to be? You're going to be an unmoving stone. You're going to block the path of evil. If evil comes, it'll have to go around you. It'll have to be slowed down. And the bigger you are, the stronger you are as that stone with your own deen and haq. 
the harder it will be for evil to do its job and the harder it will be to flow. So as there are more stones, more strength, it makes almost like a dam in a way. Evil is blocked off because with that fatua, with that actual masculine Islam, all it takes is a few good Muslim men to stop a lot of evil. And that's what I'll say. And the thing about that, uh, thank you, brother Hassan. That was amazing message. The thing about that is, you know, we see what's going on. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave us all the ability to see at least a portion of what's really happening. But that's not enough. That's just the very first step. Once you see what's what's happening, I mean, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to sit there and see it and watch? Or are you going to be able to actually wage some action, you know, get up and do something? And you can't just get up and do something if you don't have the basic, you could say, skill set, the basic development, the basic, you know, roots um, or core to do that. And that comes with just focusing on Fatoa. Now, Fatoa, if you guys watching this video don't know, it's referring to essentially chivalry. So it's, uh, Islamic chivalry doesn't just apply to men, but it also even applies to women as well. You know, your fitra, um, your ability to have the right akhlaq, the right um, moral compass, the right skill sets, you know, just fulfilling your role as a human being the proper way and not like they do today where the man is like a woman and the woman is like a man, but no, being actually who you're supposed to be and doing what you're supposed to do in the natural, you could say, organic sense uh, of it. So we, we we need to put the emphasis today, while we're still in the early 2020s, on just developing ourselves, uh, developing our skill set, you know, developing our character, our aqidah, our fiqh, our yaqeen. And that all comes from Allah. And you take action, you make the dua to Allah, and you have a, a direction inside, a goal set. And you, you just have to have that balance between you doing the action and then receiving it from Allah. So that's my input on it. I know Sheikh has a lot of excellent insights on it. And he's the one who, who brought all of this up to our attention. So Sheikh, I wanted to hear your words about Fatoa and what you feel the Muslim Ummah needs to start doing, especially the Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, so as far as today is concerned and our religious minded brothers, the first thing that I'm seeing, and I want because this is supposed to be like a discussion, so I want your input, is that look, sometimes the youth and adults, all of us, all of us, sometimes we feel like we're hypocrites, that we're not, uh, we're, we feel like, uh, you know, we're not able to be as good as we want, or, you know, uh, we slide back too much. A lot of the youth are facing problems with drugs. Uh, a lot of them are facing problems with porn, watching porn. And then that just kind of like puts them in a, in a spiral, right? Over and over again. So this, how do we deal with this? Like I'm not true to myself or I'm not strong enough or, you know, I'm, I'm hypocritical. Uh, how am I supposed to be humble, but yet be courageous? How am I supposed to be thinking I'm nothing, but at the same time, I also have confidence, like all these things that religious people would have to encounter in terms of feelings, because, uh, and, and then on top of that, we have role models that were so perfect that uh, it's very hard to measure up in our private lives with what we see as our goals in terms of accomplishment. So the first thing that I want to say to the youth which I think is extremely important, extremely important, is that you can never, every day is a rematch. And this is why sports is so important, okay? The sports language is so important, the language of talking to yourself like sports, because nowadays we're so impatient that as soon as we lose the battle with shaitan one time, two times, three times, we just give up. And uh, the whole point is not to give up. The minute you give up, you lost. It's like a rematch. Every day is a rematch. Every day is a rematch. And you focus on today. And you're not worried about tomorrow. You're not worried about how you lost yesterday. Just like, you know, uh, I just finished reading a book called Prophetic Grappling. And it was like really one of the better reads I've had in a long time. And, you know, books, not every book is meant to be read completely. It's like food, right? Some books, you just taste them. Some books, when I like a book, even if I write like a book, I don't read the whole book. I'll read the topic sentence of every paragraph, which is the first sentence, right? And finish the book like that. But this book, I read every word. So, and, and one of the things that came to my mind is the you know, these people already in a culture of like the natural environment. And it seems like based upon the studies that wrestling had come into Arabia from Egypt. Okay. And uh, these people, everyone knew wrestling, like everyone did it, all the youth did it. And it became even more organized after Islam came. 
right? And the Prophet encouraged it in his masjid, meaning the Prophet encouraged it in his masjid. And when the Prophet would try to see, okay, which youth are going to go to the battle, he would have them wrestle each other. I'm sure you've all heard those events. And so grappling, uh, because grappling became an issue when, you know, you're fighting with weapons on the horse, and then you fall off the horse, and then you're fighting with weapons, your sword breaks or his sword breaks, and then finally every fight ends up where? physical to physical combat. And so wrestling or grappling was a big part of that the background. Why am I saying that? Is that because that mentality of sports, like, okay, let's have a rematch, right? Let's, let's start again. Let's do another match. That kind of like attitude is missing with the youth. And so when they have a relapse, they think, okay, I guess Shaitan's winning and I'll just give in. Whereas we need to be in a mindset, the youth need to be in a mindset, it's okay to lose. It's okay to lose shaitan. It's not okay to give up. You know, this is why the Prophet said, follow every bad deed with a good deed, right? That if you lose, and you will lose, but there'll be times where you won't lose, number one. Number two, never try to change one habit at one time. You should try to change six or to ten habits at one time. If the Prophet was changing people one habit by one habit, Right? That would be like a very slow process. I mean, he changed the whole society. And some of the best studies on habit changing show that habits have to be stacked up. You should have six to 10 habits you're trying to change at the same time. So if you fail in two or you fail in three, or even if you fail in four, you still did two. Right? So there is that uh, kind of like, okay, I'm really weak on this one, but I did okay with this one. I did okay with my Quran reading, but I failed in not watching porn for example, right? And you keep stacking up your goals, six to 10, six to 10, six to 10, trying to meet. And why am I saying this as a, as a precursor to Fatua? Because you can't be in Fatua if you give up, right? You can't be in Fatua if you give up. And the place where Shaitan is going to break you down is your own sin. He knows your weaknesses and he's always going to touch on your weakest spot over and over again. Boom, 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 boom. Break you internally, break you internally. So if you don't have something that you're actually, that the whole thing about one of the you know, psychological aspects of exercising, besides all its physical benefits, right, is that you learn not to give up, right? You learn to be in that uncomfortable space of, uh, you know, and, and you also at the end of the at the end of 45 minutes, at the end of one hour, you feel like you accomplished something. So if you're spiritually losing the battle, you still have physically you're winning the battle. So let's say if one of your goals was and I say this because so statistically, uh, even in this group, for example, more than 50 percent of us statistically, not reality, statistically, more than 50 percent of us would be struggling with pornography, even married people are. Married men are struggling with pornography. So, huh? I, I didn't really think pornography was such a problem in the Ummah. Like, I didn't think. Oh that no, no, no. It's very, 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 very big problem. I thought something like zina would be like a big problem in the Ummah, but pornography seems like it seems like it's easier to avoid for the Ummah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi because I, we're not looking I, at I personally know many. Every single brother I know struggles with pornography, masturbation. Yeah. Well, I will say this. Um, I, I like. I really like the analogy of the battle because that's how I look at it. I mean, the battle. You. There's. It's not just one battle. I mean, there's many fronts to this battle. There's an internal battle. There's a physical battle, a mental battle, an emotional battle. There's an environmental battle. I mean, like environmental meaning the world we live in today and what they're trying to push on us. So many different battles and. And to win this battle, you got to be, you, you could say, strategic. You got to realize that the shaitan doesn't know what, what you're thinking. The shaitan doesn't know what's inside your heart. But the shaitan can hear your words. So when you're, when you're complaining, when you're saying something negative, the shaitan hears that. And then he takes that. You, you could say he's loading his bullets. He's loading his gun with every word you say. He's trying to sh shoot it back at you. You know, when you move with silence and when you start to act like you're in a war, when you're in a battle and you start to realize that you, you're you actually the one who, who has the power and the shaitan has no power. And none of these people have any power because Allah gave you free will. And you take responsibility for every single choice you make, every single thing you do. You realize um, that you genuinely, it's your fault. I mean, your life is your fault. That's what I believe, at least. And nobody can make you do anything. Nobody can make you lose except for your your own self and that comes with you you know giving the enemy more ammunition that comes with you making the choices that you make 
And it's, it's easier said than done. But the way to develop that is to realize that you're in a battle and the battle ends when you're dead. The battle ends when Allah takes your soul. And sometimes you forget, sometimes you get too comfortable, but then you snap out of it. And you, and you wake back up. You, it's, it's really just about reframing your, your perception. And if you reframe your perception in the correct way, you'll be able to then go out there and do the right things. But until you reframe your perception, you know, you're just a sleeping lion, you could say. I mean, we all have alhamdulillah body. And we have a heart, we have hands, we have eyes, we have all these tools. You could say that you're, you're soldiers, you know, all these things that Allah has given you. Your tongue is your soldier, your hands are your soldier, your body is your soldier. You got to train your soldiers, you got to, you got to, you know, use your soldiers correctly or else they'll just be, you know, wasted and distorted and the enemy will, will, will jump in at any moment. You're not vigilant, you're not awake. So that's how I look at it, uh, Sheikh. And that's just to add on to what you were saying. Now, I wanted to see everybody's perspective on Fatoa, Sheikh. Thank you for your perspective on it. But I wanted, I was curious about Brother Sadie's perspective on, on Fatoa as well. So, Bismillah, uh, Sheikh, uh, for me, I like how Brother Karim took things to the end, like the battle ends after you're dead. And uh, I like to think about Fatoa from a more philosophical perspective. For me, it's not about, it's not just about becoming fit, becoming a soldier. I really uh, thought a lot about this, like what does all of this really mean? What does it mean to be a man? So for me, as Karim said really beautifully, like the fight ends after you're dead. So for a Muslim, he goes to Jannah, inshallah. So what is Jannah? I mean, Allah has given us existence as a gift, but this gift can only be realized once you're dead and you go to Jannah, Jannah is the gift. The experience of Jannah is the gift. But why the, the question? Because Jannah is the is absolute beauty, absolute order. So with absolute order comes absolute beauty. And us experiencing that beauty is the gift. But this world, the world of dunya, there's a perfect balance of order and disorder. Order being good and disorder being evil. That makes this dunya a test for us. So Allah sent Adam alayhi salam and uh, Hawa alayhi salam as keepers of the Garden of Eden. Now, what does a garden represent? A garden represents order. It re represents structure, hierarchy. But outside of this garden lies the chaos, the evil, the darkness. So Adam alayhi salam, the man, the ideal man, has to be a protector of the woman behind him, which is Hawa, as well as the children. And in front of him lies all of this chaos. And he is at the border of this garden. He has to keep this garden from being infiltrated by agents of disorder. And how does he engage with, the, with this disorder? He engage, the way that he engages with this disorder is what I like to think of as fatuwa. Now, this can be, you know, means of combat, means of negotiation, or, you know, uh, showing intellectual uh, capacity that by following my way, you can reach closer to Allah and you can experience the ultimate gift, which is the gift of heaven, the gift of existence. Now, for me uh, to, to realize this, this engagement with the chaos, certain traits are needed, obviously, because uh, a man has to have many different skill sets. He has to be what I call his body has to be a machine of war. <laughs> it has to be perfectly fit. And with this perfect fitness, he can engage with that evil. And he can, uh, if need be, he can destroy it. The man needs to be intellectually fortified. He needs to know all of the arts, all of the sciences, so that he can rationalize with this evil. If that evil tries to match him in logic or truth, the man also needs to be able to negotiate or communicate with this evil. And for that, he needs to be educated in what the evil is an expert in. So he needs to be well-versed in the lies, the deception, the occult. Uh, I mean, not, not too deep in the occult, obviously, but the principles. As well as the man needs to have a deep connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that Allah is giving him the inspiration and the methodology to negotiate with this evil. So this is uh, what I like to think of as uh, fatwa, Sheikh. And uh, I like what Sheikh brought up, uh, wrestling, because I have wrestled. It's, it's, it's actually pretty beautiful because wrestling is not the art of killing, uh, Boxing, kickboxing, jujitsu, those uh, focus on killing your opponent, like sending them to the to death. But wrestling is the art of subduing. And what Sheikh said, 
giving a rematch, second chance. You subdue the evil and then you give it a second chance. I mean, if you, if I have wrestled and wrestling is a... For anyone who has practiced mixed martial arts, you know wrestling is the most dominant form of fighting. At the same time, it's the least violent form of fighting because you impose yourself on the enemy and then you subdue them to a level that they cannot, they have nothing over you. And this kind of symbolizes to me also the life that a man leads. I mean, there is so much chaos out there. You don't know what lies ahead of you, but then you still venture out into the into the chaos, into the open. And there has to be a woman behind you so that she can uh, keep surging you on. And the way what wrestling shows me is like once you subdue that evil, once you subdue that chaos, you can give the evil a second chance to repent and come back to the truth, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to existence. This is what I, this is my opinion of Fatuwa. So once we have dealt with this at the psychological level, where you're not giving up, every day is a new battle, and every day you try to make it better than the day before, then now you're prepared to enter into the realm of Fatuwa. If you look at Sutul Kahf, uh, where it talks about the fata, the young man that was with Musa, والسلام, the first principle that is mentioned is not giving up. What does Musa say? I'm going to keep walking until ages. I'm not going to give up. Hmm. Right? Until, and, the, and the, the young man didn't complain. Musa complained, I've become tired. Meaning, imagine this, that you know how strong Musa was? The young man took it in, meaning he sucked it up, right? And then Musa is like, where's the lunch? I'm now tired. Even though he started off being the one saying, okay, now we're going to walk and we're going to keep walking and we're not going to give up until even if ages pass. And so th the way that the religious minded Muslim youth have been destroyed is because they give up because of the level of distractions and temptations, then the doubt sometimes that overcomes them, they give up and they give up. And so then they recede, right? Instead of having a mentality of, no, I need to keep marching forward. I need to, I'm not. And this is what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, because before, for me, as I'm dealing with the youth here in our jama uh, over here, and I'm looking at them, I'm seeing that, it, it's it's not that they don't have potential or they're not committed to the deen or that they don't love Allah and his messenger and that they're not willing to do whatever. It's that they are, they're defeated internally. They're defeated psychologically. So what happens is you end up doing one sin and then feeling bad and doing forgiveness from Allah. And then next thing you know, you're doing it again. And next thing you know, you're doing it again and again and again. And so like the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Renew your iman by saying that ilaha illallah. So meaning you sometimes need to give yourself a clean slate, right? And if you don't have perseverance, what is going to end up happening is you're going to begin to give up and you're going to feel like you're a hypocrite. I do it because I enjoy it, like in the case of pornography, and then I fall into the same thing. Or you're religious and you have a girlfriend and you have religious mind, you have religious friends, but you're doing, you know, you're caught up in something, you ask for forgiveness and then you go back to it. And this is really this phase where the, the, the shaitan is hoping people will just give up. And if they give up, then shaitan wins. And this, what I tell the youth is this, is that it's acceptable to do the sin. It's not ever acceptable to give. It's just not, okay? That's like, you know, the fish is caught in the net and just says, okay, you know, take me. And, you know, there's there's a story of uh, the three fishes, okay, that uh, there was a, a, a fish that was an alim or a scholar and a fish that was just lazy, never did anything. And the other one was just smart, okay? And uh, so the smart fish started no noticing there's a lot of nets, or a lot of fishing hooks going into this lake. So he told the other two, I'm going to go out into the open sea and leave this comfort zone I'm in. So the, uh, the smart one said, well, I'm going to follow him because I think he knows what he's talking about. And the lazy one said, no, I'm not moving. I'm going to stay right here. So when he got caught and he was in the frying pan, he said, if I was ever to go back to that situation, I would follow the scholar. You see, that's what happens when you give up right, is, is that you're not even trying to leave the trap, right? Mm -hmm. And at, at least as long as you're putting in effort to fight shaitan or to fight the trap, you may win today, you may lose three times in a row. But as long as you do istighfar, 
you follow up a bad deed with a good deed. And as long as you give yourself a clean slate and you keep trying and trying and trying, that is better than just giving up because that's, you have only two options. Either you move forward and keep losing yeah. or you give up, right? And then one day when Allah will have mercy, that losing will become winning. Sometimes mm -hmm. wallahi, losing is better than winning because when you're losing, you feel more remorseful and you are pleading Allah more than if you don't, if you, if you actually succeed, you're actually praying to Allah less intensely. Mm -hmm. And when you're not meeting, if you're like stuck on, no, I have to fight this, I have to fight this. And you have make the intention and you strategize and you plan like it's a sports game or it's a war and you try to fight it and you still lose and you feel bad and you do toba and you do istighfar and then you come back to Allah and you try again the next Fajr morning. You know, that is better than somebody who succeeds on all his goals, but didn't feel uh, faqr uh, in front of Allah that I need Allah. I'm helpless, right? I can't do this without your help. Um, so sometimes losing the battle is actually beneficial. And when shaitan notices that for you, it brings you closer to Allah that you're losing the battle, then shaitan is also in a dilemma that I'm making him lose, yeah. but it's actually bringing him closer to Allah because he feels so remorseful, mm. right? And then shaitan will be like, okay, meet your goal. At least you're less, you're less remorseful than if you don't meet your goals, you're more remorseful. And if you do meet your goals, you're less closer to Allah, then he'll try another attack. But my main point is this, is that the, for the Muslim youth, the most important thing, the most important thing is don't ever forget to give up. That's where I see 90% of the religious Muslim youth, this is where they're failing. They don't have the persistence and they don't have the mentality of I'm not going to give up. And they don't have the, um, they don't have the, uh, and I'll end this with this. Look, the Quran, uh, I'll mention two, three things. And then, you know, I, I want other people to talk, but I really feel this is a very important part of a pre-conversation to Futuwa. It's like the pre council mm -hmm. that uh, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of the, you can say D minus grade, mm -hmm. that's what the loss, right? You're in loss unless you do these, these. This is like D minus. Mm -hmm. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the people that have A, Meaning they're like, they're like, wow, they're way up there. Allah describes them in this way. Indeed, those who said Allah is a Rabb, then they become glued to this. The angels come down upon them. And what do they say? Don't fear. This is about particularly in reference to time of revelation when the Sahaba are going through its extreme persecution. And then they say, and have the good news of Jannah that you have been promised for your struggles we are your friends in this life and the next life so these are these are people that are become muslim out of the risk of their life and they've glued themselves this to this even if they die they're not going to let go and angels come upon them especially at the moments of their death telling them you know there's good news for you about these people allah says you won't reach this stage except if you have a lot of sabr Persistent. Mm. And you won't reach this stage unless you have great fortune. I mean, good luck. Meaning you have Allah's help. Then Allah says, And if shaitan makes you fall down, then stand up immediately. I'm giving an idiomatic translation. If shaitan makes you slip, turn to Allah. What happens is shaitan makes us slip and we go away from him. We give up. I'm saying we're not worthy anymore. We feel like we're not worthy anymore. Mm. That's, thank you for saying that. You know, we feel we're hypocritical. Mm. And the actual thing is that even people at that level, they have their own battle. They may not have your battle. They may have their own battle. Their battle may be that I didn't read 10 Jews of Quran and they actually feel bad about it. Just like somebody today will feel bad about, I, you know, watch dirty pictures, for example. And this is why that the, the simile given in Quran, Allah is the one who takes them out of darkness into light. Because whatever is the receding side, you see it as darkness, no matter where you are in the scale. And so Allah is taking you out of darkness into light. So your goal is to go into the light. But when you reach there, that's darkness compared to the next level of light. I'll give you an example. This state 
of I'm no good, I'm not worthy, will always be there, no matter at what level you are. Like, I'll give you an example. One of the great scholars of the Indian subcontinent was Ahmad Ali Lahori Rahmatullahi. This is a person that when he died, he was doing musafaha with the angels. Like he's on his deathbed and he's like literally like shaking hands with the angels, right? He used to, one day, one of his students said, Sheikh, you know, you're so such and such and, you know, you're such a blessing. And he had done many things for the deen and he started crying. I'm just like a garbage can. And then he really felt that. I'm like a garbage because there were moments where he felt he's nothing. I'm helpless. I'm, st- I'm, I'm not worthy. Why are you people like respecting me like this, right? I'm not worthy of this. So that feeling of I'm not worthy will happen whether you're watching porn or you have doubts if Allah exists or if your character becomes bad with your parents. That'll happen whether you're at that stage or whether you're at the stage of missed one prayer today or I uh, didn't do my uh, dhikr today, right? It's like it's a spectrum and you're always going to feel not worthy because you're always in a battle and when you lose the battle, you feel like you're not worth it. Some people will go through a phase where they're like, I didn't see Prophet Muhammad for a long time in my dream. You know, what's wrong with me? And, and so my main message to the youth, and I know maybe I kind of like twisted the whole conversation of Fatua, maybe not in the direction. And we can go into those other directions. But I just wanted this to be a precursor because based upon my experience of talking to the youth, this is a very important point that never give up. You're always in the battle. Even if you give up, you're still in the battle. Now he's going to throw you more back and more back and more back. So the minute you give up, which is what, honestly, 99% of the youth are doing psychologically. The 90% of 99% of the religious youth that, and, and all of us, all of us, I'm talking about me, I'm talking about all of us. The reality is we're all caught up in one sin or another sin. And shaitan's trying to use that to psychologically break us down. Okay. And the whole thing is that if you just be passive about it, then you're going to keep losing, number one. Number two, if you become broken about it, you're going to keep losing anyway. And then he's going to continue the battle, even if you've lost, right? Then he's going to try to annihilate you. But you, if as long as you every day you wake up, nope, today's a new day. Maybe Allah will bless me today. Maybe it'll happen after five years. Some of the shayukhs used to say to me that it takes five years to, or more to change sometimes. Mm. Like to have that real change, mm. right? Sometimes it takes 20 years, right? Sometimes it takes a long time for that change to occur. But it will only occur after losing and losing and losing and losing and losing. And then one day you begin to win. One day you just... You just, it's like in any other fight. If somebody keeps beating you up, one day you just come to a point of like, okay, I'm not going to let this happen, right? And then you actually, if you're intending to fight, then you will give it a good fight. If a baby doesn't learn how to walk in the first try, it keeps yes. falling, it keeps falling, it keeps falling. Eventually. My message to the Muslim youth is it's okay to fall, right? My Sheikh, Dr. Asar, he actually gives this example for this very same ayah that we're talking about. He says that, you know, if you're riding a bicycle, some people are, you know, uh, and I'm adding to his similitude, some people are riding the bicycle slow, some are fast, some are very fast. But when you fall, you don't stay fallen. You get on back on the bicycle and keep going, right? You just keep going, you keep fighting, you keep fighting. And every day you have your goals that you want to meet and you keep training your brain that no i want to i want to do the opposite of what i'm doing i did want to add one thing um you know that's i think the most important advice sheikh mashallah of course i think the very most important thing before you get into fatwa is it's really just one principle is just don't give up if you miss a salah just show up the next time if you do this do that don't do it next time you just follow up every bad thing with a good thing for me what worked with me was you know, whenever I I could say I could say committed a sin or did, did something, I would go and pray two rakats istighfar, and I would I would go and sujood and I would just apologize for what I just did there, and I promise not to do it again. And I kept doing that over and over again until multiple years passed by, and it just things just changed. And I think that's the best, um, in my opinion. What worked with me is is to just keep following up everything you do with with uh, a good deed or at least two rakats of intention or repentance to to resolve it from there so that's my input on that and what comes with giving up is beginning to hate yourself 
at a very deep level. You have izza for yourself, honor for yourself, as long as you don't give up. But the minute you give up, you no longer are looking forward to the future of your better self. And you're resigning to your, your less, your default self. When, when you give up, uh, you're stationary and you're just waiting for the darkness to consume you, chaos to just overtake you. And then you'll just be helpless. But if you're just taking one step forward, that's one more inch you're walking in this vast earth that Allah has created. Allah also has created the man as an explorer. He explores the earth, uh, explores Allah's natural beauty. So you take one more step, you see something new. And the darkness, Satan, he knows that this guy is not easy. You know, he, he still walks despite all the pain, all the rejection, all the death, suffering, disease that he had to overcome. He's still walking. And then Shaitan, even you get the respect of Shaitan. Shaitan knows that I have to work harder on this guy. You know, yeah, I have to put more things on his way. I mean, the other thing about that is the self-esteem. Um, I feel, I see this a lot in people. They, they have a low self-esteem. But the people who succeed, the people who you could say even the non-Muslims will become very rich or whatever they succeed at, they have very high self-esteem. They, they believe in themselves. They believe in what they believe in and what they're doing. But see, to get to that point, you need to accumulate evidence. You know, your brain is an evidence-seeking machine. I, yes. I found this out that your brain is always trying to reaffirm a specific story you tell yourself or a specific reality that you believe is true. Your brain is constantly seeking evidence. And if you can change the way you perceive what's happening inside you and around you in a way that's building evidence towards who you're trying to become or what you're trying to become, that will build esteem in you. I mean, let's say you, you know, you were doing very bad in something and now you're starting to go to the gym every day. You're building evidence every day, every mm. day that you, you do that 14th rep, every day that you see a little tiny um, growth in your arm or in your chest. Mm. Or if you're in sales every day that you start to get better at sales, you, you need to make sure you're consciously telling yourself, hey, look, that is evidence that I am very good at this, that I can do this and that I will win this. And it's, I think that's another advice that has to go with persistency is, is, is building that evidence and having a goal of what you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to re-perceive about yourself. Building that esteem comes from taking that action, building the right evidence. You can just, you know, be aware of what evidence is your brain building. People who, let's say, have a bad mindset, they're constantly reaffirming that their reality sucks or people that have a good mindset, they're constantly reaffirming that their, their reality is awesome, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's what I wanted to add to that. Hey, uh, an example of Fatua is a jihad in that way, because we have the spiritual jihad, the inner jihad that we have to say that, look, we have our sins. We have to better ourselves. We have to do this struggle. We have to struggle constantly against our sins. And that element of Fatua and never ending that struggle is as Muslims, we are in an endless jihad in ourselves to always fight against our sins. This goes external. What is fatua for the external? If there's a tyrant, if there's tyranny, if there's evil going on, you're standing against it. That's the external jihad. So fatua in itself is inherently linked with jihad and that fatua is what you need to wage it effectively in all its forms. Fatua is the building block of the man who is the mujahideen. Uh, jihad is the action that you are taking. Exactly. I agree with that 100%. And Shiv, I also like uh, uh, one of the problems in Muslims, because I like to think of something like you never know the value of something unless you lose it. For example, a healthy man, he never knows the value of his health. He, he takes it for granted unless he loses one aspect of his health. Now he he always yearns for it. He, he wishes to get his health back. So I, I see two extremes in the Ummah right now. Either Muslims are completely uh, nonchalant, relaxed. They don't care about any of the restrictions of their religion. You know, zina, gambling, drinking, drugs, everything. And on the other extreme, you have completely close-minded Muslims who their view and they, if you don't pray like them, kafir. If you don't do wudu like them, kafir. They will even go to jihad uh, over, over like tiny matters. So I've seen many Muslims, even myself, I was uh, also very ultra conservative, but there was a certain point in my life where I, I, I was not a thinker, I was just a follower, but many things happened and I had to struggle and uh, with depression and, and other things because I did not know why I believed in what I believed in. So gradually I lost interest in praying, I lost interest in Islam, I lost interest in everything. But then as I was losing interest, I lost Islam slowly. 
But as I lost it, Allah put Allah put guidance in me. I, I forged a real connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Islam that I got after I lost it was much stronger than the blind following that I had before. So my point is that a soldier of Allah, a man who is on fatuwa, sometimes he needs just solitude, just detachment from everything, from the matrix, from all of this, just to contemplate and forge that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he knows for sure in his heart what he believes in. Because if you don't know what you believe in, how are you going to defend what you believe in? That, that's uh, kind of what I wanted to say here. That's actually very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, if you, you know, to be a man means to partly means that you have something to believe in and something to fight yeah. for. Right. And I think that contemplative mindset is another thing that's missing from the youth. Uh, Alhamdulillah, not with the youth that are here, um, but generally in the ummah, um, even the religious minded youth, I don't think have majority of them have not come to this contemplative state of being where they actually have a belief system that they feel like that owns them, mm. right? Like this is ideas that own me, not like something I'm not, it's not just following a sheikh or it's not like this school of thought versus that school of thought. It's like, these are my, like it, it may be, he maybe learned it from other people. It's like Imam Ghazali talks about this in his book. He says that the ideas that you own, kind of like that you even got from others, but it becomes so real for you that it's like your own ideas, right? Yeah. So like, I think like in this state of modernity, uh, we talked about how temptation affects fatua, right? Or, or how uh, falling for temptation affects fatua. But the other side of this that's specifically modern is that is the is the idea of doubt because in in the previous centuries doubt wasn't as big of a of a of a trick <laughs> as in the modern times because the the whole modern modern way of thinking is of scientific rationalism and all the things that go along with it is built upon the idea of doubt which is completely antithetical to Islam in its process of thinking <laughs> and so one thing every Muslim every youth has to do is exactly what you're saying find that solitude find that place where you will be alone with your real self and and kind of like confirm or deconfirm what is it that you believe in what is it that you stand for what are your principles in life you know most people don't even have principles in life anymore they just do whatever other people are doing they don't know they don't have a firm stance on anything you know a mu'min's like a tree it's flexible right like a tree is flexible for the wind but it's also rooted somewhere where it's not gonna so if his you know if his he has problems with his wife or children or people. He's flexible, you know, okay, I'll, I'll negotiate. Yeah. But he's also rooted in like a tree where he's not going to be flexible. And I think those elements of not having principles, not having something to believe in, not having something that you will, you know, something that you own as, as your own worldview, uh, I think is something very much missing from the Muslim world and the Muslim youth. And, and, and the clear proof of that is our reaction to this whole mess of, uh, of circus. <laughs> the bug, the bug, yeah. I'd say far worse than even uh, the whole bug stuff is our reaction to our Muslim brothers. Mm. Our reaction of like, sectarianism and like exactly. Iraq when Muslims are still Muslims. Our reaction to our permissibility of some things, like there being kafir soldiers in Arabia, in the same country where Mecca and Medina lie, there are kafir soldiers who their job is to kill other Muslims. Hmm. And we allow that. that that's that's the, one of the worst possible things. And that's because the failure of like the stones in the river. We will hmm. not we will not permit this. But it was because it, they, they were eroded. They were given so much wealth that they were like, we'll, we'll leave Islam. We'll leave Fatullah. We'll leave what is required of us because we want dunya. And that dunya they sold for, what benefit will that be on the day of judgment for them? No benefit. There's no benefit there. Sheikh, uh, building on what uh, Brother Hassan is saying, that uh, when the hypothetical, of course, Islam doesn't have borders, but I'm saying, in, uh, speaking ideologically, philosophically, when the borders of Islam are infiltrated, it's infiltrated because the men are not practicing fatwa. 
And when the men are not practicing fatwa, the first target are usually the women. That's why we know the hadith, when the Dajjal comes, majority of his followers will be women. Now, why will the majority of his followers be women? Are women naturally evil? More or more evil to men? No, that's not the answer. It's because when the men are not strong when the men are not the men don't know what they believe or don't are not ready to defend what they believe then they leave the borders of islam and the borders of islam are infiltrated and the women are hypnotized by dajjal and they go to dajjal that is exactly what's happening in in the ummah now I'm, i mean i see all these i mean i see such degeneracy in the amongst uh, it's it's better not to specify but yeah would you agree sheikh yeah i mean um Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You all know what uh, Sheikh Imran Hussain says about Britain, right? Yeah. 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 So see how all of those things have evolved, right? Feminism, it started out as feminism and now it's becoming like gender neutral. Like now it's mm. like, like more, it's like more perverse. Mm. It started out as feminism and now it includes homosexuality and God knows what other things. It started out as Israel, which was supposed to be a homeland for the Jews, but now Jerusalem is its capital. And so then that now it's beginning to take on a religious significance and move in a, a very specific direction. Mm. And uh, you have, you know, the Bank of England starting out with paper money. And now that's going into the digital world and whatnot will come from that. So you can see these things evolving from the modern to the postmodern world. Um, and and so and, and it's more than that. I mean, those are like some elements that Sheikh Imran Hussein mentions. But even like Hollywood was the original investors were all from England. The point being that are influenced by this because uh, men have not done their jobs, right? And when they find more, women will always move in the direction where they find more security. And if men are not secure themselves, how are they going to be secure for their women? Right? Exactly. Beautiful. If they're downbeaten within themselves, if they have low self-esteem themselves, if they're dealing with self-hatred themselves, how are the women going to uh, look up to them? Now, a perfect example of this is like the Amish, even mm. though they're completely separated, they look back where, meaning from the Muslim perspective, right? Something mm. that the average Muslim can't even begin to appreciate is that why do the Amish women not leave all their men and go into the cities mm. and marry them? Because they're not people of low self-esteem. Because their men are real men in the sense that... Do you know the Amish have a principle of non-violence? Mm. That's, just... one of their principles. That's one of their principles. The Amish people, they do not engage in violence. But they know how to build houses. They know how to build a fire. They know how to do things. They're strong. You know, they have manly qualities, in other words. They're more likely to keep their promises than maybe somebody else. More likely to keep their promises than Muslim men. Uh, mm. for that but the point being that... When exactly like you said, when women, when men are not living up to a certain ex internal, uh, natural expectation that women have from men, exactly. that gives them a sense of security, right? When men don't feel secure themselves, you're not going to feel secure about anything if you don't have principles to live for, mm. right? Your enemy who has principles that he lives for is on a better grounding than a Muslim that who's Muslim culturally, but has no grounding on what is it that I really live for? Well, that's the thing. Um, I mean, Brother Hassan in one of his videos talking about the domestication, you could say of men, or even other people were talking about the, col the colonization of the Ummah's minds. Basically, you know, people have been infiltrated and put a web over. Uh, Sheikh Omar, do you remember the, the diagram that... Uh, Brother Zaid, Omar Zaid sh shared on your video with the people had a chain or had some sort yeah. of, you know what I'm talking about? With, where, where they were like enslaved to a jinn or something yeah. like that. That picture really represents what's going on. And those men who can break free from that chain, who can create their own houses, create their own fire, create their own reality. Those are the, those are the men that are able to stand up for something and believe in something. And in our case, it should be Islam. But in their case, it may be Christianity. It may be something else. But that, the idea is that they, they believe in something. So that's, that's a good point. Yeah, a true man lives in his dream world. He creates the world. Iqbal talks about exactly. this in, in his Madhli Momin, you know, uh, the concept he gave of the, of the Mu'min man. Iqbal, in one of his poems, he says, if you are a pigeon, if that is what you are, if you're a pigeon and you got killed, it's your fault for being a pigeon. Why didn't you change the world? Why didn't you create the world that you imagined? Why were you not changing the world? Why didn't you become an eagle? Why didn't you become something bigger and better?
yeah, I mean, he, he, uh, the mu'min, the man, creates the world into his image. Yes. That if I, like, for example, right, I have a certain image of what the world should be like. Well, mm -hmm. I'm going to fight, right? I'm going to fight for the world to be the way I feel it. I feel there should be a khidafah, for example. Mm -hmm. I feel there should be a jama'ah. Whatever it, it, it is, it's a dream war. It's not reality, yes. but it is my world. Yes. Men fight for their goals. I will die for it. No one can ever convince mm -hmm. me, no matter what they do to me, that no Muslims should not have khidafah. And Shaykh, that that's a martyr. That is a martyr because Men every every martyr spirit. has an image like this, and he dies for it. That's why Allah honors the martyr to such a high extent because they believe what they fight for, and they fight for what they believe in. The men of the Ummah fight for what they believe in, and they try and die for their Lord. The slaves of Satan fight for money. They fight for what the world has, but the man has his goal. He has his vision. He has his dream and he fights for that. And that goes beyond money. It goes beyond status. It goes beyond all these things. They're lower than it. So that man is more powerful than that other man. The imagination is extremely important. Um, I, I really believe personally, if you can use your imagination um, and, and use it in the right way. I mean, think about those people who have become very rich, for example, and they have lots of money and they can use that money to create whatever they want physically in the physical realm. That same way they have an imagination for that. Imagine the same man was a Muslim man who understands what's going on, who understands Fatola, who has all these understandings, mashallah and akhlaq, and uses that same imagination, the same resources provided to him to at least try to pave pave that world that he has in his head we need more men like that we, we need more men like that it can't just be these non-muslim people who have yeah. that imagination and have the resources we need more men who have resources and who have that powerful imagination and confidence in it to to create what we're talking about here at least help imagine a world where there's a khalifa where there's justice where there's mm, exactly. islam established yeah Shik, i yes, think what, what uh what uh, brother Karim said is so beautiful because uh, he said we need more Muslims like this. Do you know? Do you guys know people like Andrew Tate, uh, Dan Bilzerian, these these types oh, yeah. of kingpin like figures? For example, they are men, and they in their minds they have a vision of how they want to live: unlimited women, mansions, r money, riches. And so look at what they did. In they had that imagination and they manifested it. They are living the life they want. Now, of course, we don't condone that lifestyle, but you have to give it to them that they're living the way they want. Where are the Muslims who are trying to create, where the Muslim men who are trying to create this utopia, like I, I like to call it holy Jerusalem. Where where are the men who are trying to establish this utopia state, this state which is built on justice, eradication of evil, beauty, harmony, nature. Where are the men who are trying to create this for the Muslims, you know? Yeah, so, and majority of the Muslims, you know, they're, 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 the track they're on is, okay, well, this is some of them, but, you know, let me finish school, I'm going to get married, I'm going to find out what's halal, I'm going to find out what's haram, I'm going to stay within the limits that, that society permits me. Right. Uh, I, but no idea of changing society, yes. no idea of, of, you know, that I could have a world of my own and I should struggle for it. None. And these people that are like fighting for the reset, for example, right. Mm -hmm. I'm just same example, but on the exact opposite, meaning Hezbollah, inshallah, may Allah accept us amongst his party. Mm -hmm. and, but the opposite is Hezbollah Shaytan. Now, these people yes. that are like the clause guy talking about this was his, these are no, their so ideas money ideas and they're struggling day and night to manifest bring that in, to yeah. manifest right to take humanity into the next level of darkness and 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 there's very few muslims who are thinking about okay how can i take humanity and the muslims into the next level of light exactly they're all, within this, they're all living in within the same system given to them by that matrix that is actually part of the other side hmm. i think uh, what we were just talking about was very mashallah important and empowering as well. The imagination. I mean, I see, like you guys were saying, I see all these these entrepreneurs, all these people who talk about getting rich and making a lot of money. And it's really just the same imagination. Imagine that imagination is used for, for bringing more people to light, bringing more people to Islam. We need more people in this home who, who want to be the best they can be, who want to be entrepreneurs, who want to who want to use their imagination to create a reality that fits their uh, desires, that fits their standards, and their desires for good, for what Allah loves. Uh, so I think that's an important motivating factor. But to get to that point, I mean, you got to, 
I think you got to at least start to uncover yourself and heal yourself. Sheikh, you always talk about healing yourself. But once you heal yourself, once you get healed, once Allah heals you, you start to unlock, you could say, the inner lion, the inner potential, the inner imagination. You start to live in this state of joy, this state of, of motivation. I can't explain it, but it's a very powerful state. Yeah, and what I want to also express are two, two, two other things. There's no such thing as self-discipline, meaning it doesn't work. And there, and and motivation works temporarily. Self-discipline doesn't work because according to all the studies that uh, if I am trying not to have a donut, which I love, then every time I go by a store, so let's say if in a day I pass by a donut store 10 times, I may have the discipline to not give in one time, two times, three times, four times, but eventually you give in. That's the yeah. nature of me. the people that are best in quote unquote self-discipline. It is by keeping away from the things that tempt them in the first place that they don't even give themselves the opportunity to fall into uh, the temptation. So self-discipline in the idea that we think of self-discipline doesn't exist. The second thing is motivation is always temporary and it ends up sometimes making you feel bad because you have a high and then you have a low. Mm -hmm. What you have to aspire for is in, to be inspired. That is what lasts forever. Mm -hmm. I, when you become inspired, when you become inspired, it is a kind of like a low level natural motivation that's always with you. Yeah. Okay. Spark. You have a spark. When you have that spark, when you have that, this is again something most Muslims, most Muslim youth are not inspired by anything. They, they may be inspired by a few things, but they're not giving them the light of something that's sparking them so motivation doesn't work long term it may end up making people feel bad discipline again will only work as long as the discipline is strong and the person's very self-vigilant but what really does work is to be inspired and what you're inspired by is what you kind of like there's a love relationship with your dream world mm -hmm. and love makes you do things much faster than self-discipline what you will do to what in Arabic we call riyadah, exercises, like a lot of prayers and du'as and so on and so forth. Love will take you that very fast. The thing is, is that there's no common dream that we're all on the same boat and we have a common dream that we're like the Muslims. We're all just nomads. We don't mm -hmm. have a dream, right? Just passing and through. We're just passing through. So there, there, if there is, you know, one of the side effects of people like Sheikh Imran Hussein, whether you agree or disagree, that it, one of the side effects is that he's not only waking you up to new knowledge, but he's, give, he's inspiring people. He's giving them something to look forward to in the future, because that's what inspiration has to do with, has to do with the future. You know, they say that, uh, uh, meaning, I don't know if I should mention it here or not, but I'll mention it, right? Is that it, one of the one of the things you want to do with your wife always is to tell her like give her a future because women are looking for security look you know this is what we're going to do like keep her like on page this is what this is what i intend to do because that gives them okay okay i see yeah okay we're going to do that yeah we're going to go camping every you know what i'm trying to say so yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you, you inspire people by giving them the possibility of what could be and that inspiring you is part of how you see the world the Muslims are not inspired by anything. What are your principles is one aspect, right? What are the things you're willing to die for? Mm -hmm. But the other side of the same coin is what are you inspired by? What inspires you, right? Why do you wake up, right? And the so, so there, there may be some people that are inspired by, okay, I want to make a million dollars, I guess. I don't know. But it doesn't has no absolute inspiration for me at all. I see it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't See why even it would inspire somebody. And I'm sure there are people who, when will listen to me and say, oh, you want Khilafah and, you know, you want to, you know, to look at this future and get out of the city and then, you know, do all these great things and join the Mahdi. They'll look at me and say, what nonsense is that? You know, but either way, I'm inspired. And so my inspiration is like my love. And it is a low level motivation that's always there. The majority of the Muslim youth don't have anything that they're inspired by because they are fragmented, fragmented in a sense, they're part of some sectarian group, or they listen to, there's no real future. 
Hmm. Like, what are we doing with our sheikh in the next 20 years? Where does our sheikh intend to take us on this boat ride? What are we going to do? If there's no, there's no inspiration. I mean, what is, there's no, there's no, you're not being inspired. The Sahaba, when they were in Mecca, they were inspired and they always knew that there will be better days. And the Prophet kept saying it. Wallahi nattasajim. You're in a hurry. These are bad days. Allah will change it. And Quran kept coming and giving them good news for the persecution they're going through and giving them the stories of Fir'aun and others that look, you know, the, the, it always comes around to bite them what they're doing. So don't worry. You'll be taken care of. Make hijrah, right? So they were inspired. They knew that if they're with the hero, because the hero, what does a hero do? Hero gives you a future, yes. gives you dream to live for, principles to live for. The Muslim youth, I mean, why should I stop watching dirty pictures? I have nothing to live for. Mm. It's, it's so that, and again, all of this is a prerequisite to even step into Fatuwa. So I'm sorry I spent time there, but I think it's really important for the Muslim youth, these basic concepts that, that we're trying to talk about. They're, they're like, they have to be there and they have to be experienced. You know, they, there's not many, too many scholars that inspire a community, a people or the ummah. Mm -hmm. And that can't happen unless you're showing them a future, that there is a future. We have a future. The future is ours. We have bad times today, but tomorrow is ours. So anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm sorry about Sheikh, that. I'll give you one example. I call it death by restriction, which means that uh, uh, one of the problems I see in Muslims today, I mean, it's it's not even a small problem. It's a huge problem, huge problem. And I think this is why we're, none of us are inspired. The youth especially are not inspired because they are dying by restriction, death by restriction. So I'll give you an example. One, once I was uh, with one of my friends from Iran and he is Shia. And we were having a beautiful conversation, an ideal conversation, uh, something like today. And then one, one brother I know, he comes to me and he's, I see his facial expression and it's a, it's a look of dismay and disdain. And he comes to me and he says, uh, this guy is Shia. I said, so what? Uh, he said, what do you mean so what? He's Shia. I said, okay, so? And then he says, he's not Muslim. Don't you get it? He's not Muslim. Why are you talking about Islam with him? I said, what do you mean he's not Muslim? He is Muslim. I just prayed with him. And I, I, I asked the brother, aren't you Muslim? He says, I'm Muslim. <laughs> and then that other brother doesn't even look at him. He says, no, he's not Muslim, he's Shia. Because of him, the Rafidi, and then he, he goes to another tangent. Yeah, and, and this is the other big problem we have generally in the Ummah is that we hate our sectarian groups more than we hate the non-Muslim. Exactly. Okay. Then I, I, I just tell the brother that, brother, he says there is one God and he believes in the last messenger. Is there any other criteria for being a Muslim? He says, brother, this, 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 the Irafida, this, Ali, this, that. And then I said, no, no, bro, did he, does he believe in one God and the messenger? Yes or no? Yes. Except for him, for me, he's a Muslim. Now, you are now being the disruption for us. For us making progress, you are the disruption. And there are millions like you. So this is what this is crazy, Sheikh. And this is like, you will even see this in the chat groups. Like chat groups that we are on, it's crazy. The sectarian, sectarian hate people have for each other. The, the term Rafidi was invented by a Shia. It's not even a Sunni term. It was invented by a Shia named uh, Zayd, yeah. uh, Zayd ibn Ali, who was starting a rebellion against the, he was a Shia who was starting a rebellion against the Umayyads. And he called the Shia who weren't willing to fight with him Rafidi. Mm. It, they're using a Shia term. So by saying that they're calling themselves Shia, it's a weird little paradox thing. You're using a term invented by a Shia to call other Shia who was only saying it because they were cowards. It wasn't saying it because they're theological reasons, because they're cowards. Yeah, yeah Sheikh, the point is like, how can we make any progress and be inspired by the greater good, the ideal lifestyle, when like these differences are like chains holding us back? And you know, if you think you, you are over one difference, another difference comes in, another comes in, another comes in. And the Muslims are just being distracted, distracted by these differences. They cannot focus on one vision. They're just distracted by these differences and they keep focusing, like oh, they have OCD over these differences. It's a huge problem, in my opinion, amongst the Ummah. This is the result of being away from the Book of Allah. This is the result of not making the Book of Allah 
the primary source of your in being inspired. And that's what the Book of Allah does. It gives you inspiration. If you read Quran, it'll build that low level motivation that always stays with you. You don't need to hear a speech to be inspired. It's like the Quran puts little fires inside you and they're your, they become your burning desires, right? And the, the Quran inspired, look, the Quran inspired the Sahaba to change the world. And they saw the, the manifestation of the Quran in a human form, the Prophet, mm. right? Yeah. Which they even, Aisha describes him as the walking Quran. And the other companions in his last day of his life described him when he came for the Fajr prayer and he moved the curtain. They said, I mean, these are the exact words used for the face of the Prophet. It was like he's waraqatul Quran, like he's a page of the Quran. This is how his face was described. Right? So the Prophet was like a walking Quran, right? He was the manifestation of that Quran, which is what people, again, they, they want to be inspired by Quran, but they want to separate it from that practical example of how he inspired others. And then, anyway, the point being that when you're reading Quran, again, you will always find people that are calling to Quran, inspiring people, because that is the book of inspiration. It is the book that goes deep down in your hearts. This everything, the symbolism, even if like there's certain symbolism Quran uses over and over again, from lightness to dark, for example, or the tree or the symbolism of business trade. Right. Uh, other symbolisms Quran uses the, even the symbols when they begin to go down into you, uh, the story, every one of us is the story of Adam in a sense, right? And some we've all sinned and then repented. And so when these things go deep into you, they begin to inspire you. And this is why the book of Allah is so important and why Allah specifically in Surah Al-Imran says, this is the book that will unite you. Because Allah says, Hold on to the rope of Allah, meaning Quran, and don't be separated. If kuntum a'da'an, you were enemies of one another. And he brought your hearts together. And you became brothers by the ni'mah of Allah, by the blessing of Allah. It happened via Quran, being inspired by the book of Allah. And Quran doesn't divide us into sectarianism. Quran doesn't do it. Quran gives us a view of the world, how to look at the world, how to look at civilization. Where is your place in this civilization? What are the natural laws, the sunnahs of Allah that are in place? What could be, right? What are the goals Quran gives you? What are your principles you should stand for? For example, right? Leave the riba system. Otherwise you're at war with Allah and his message. So these are the principles Quran is giving us. Mm -hmm. And then you begin to study it and you're like, okay, here's the wisdom. And you begin to imagine a world that the Quran gives you. And you begin to imagine a world that should be according to Allah. And it's an all-inclusive world. It's the Quran is talking to Christians. The Quran is talking to the Jews. The Quran is talking to the pagan. The Quran is talking to the atheist. It's it's a world in your mind that you're in. You're engaged with the whole world in your mind because you're reading Quran. And it's a world that it's the book that's telling you, hey, don't do this. Eat halal and tayyiba. Eat the pure food. Don't eat poison. Right. It's it's telling you to look at nature, to contemplate, to find yourself. To find Allah and to find yourself, find your place in, 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 in this cosmos. And so the book of Allah is the book of inspiration, you can say. And But for that, you have to know basic level of Arabic. You have to know at least that much that at least the basic Arabic, the barrier between you and Allah is the, at the basic. You don't have to be a scholar, but some basic Arabic. I mean, the Jews have done a great job at reviving the Hebrew language. They started mm -hmm. off Yiddish from Europe, learning the Yiddish language that was there, what they grew up with. Now everyone in Israel, these same Yiddish people ended up in Israel. And now everyone in Israel through their educational system speaks Hebrew. Mm. We Muslims have uh, not failed to, I mean, most most uh, Muslims are focusing on, you know, uh, the none of, uh, majority don't know Quranic Arabic, including, unfortunately, myself. And this is something we really need to make primary focus we need to make our goal and check another thing uh most uh the thing is i i wanted you to speak on is time because uh majority of muslims i mean we live in this matrix where everything is fixed you know one of the things i like to uh, say is compare the lives of a young Muslim men like today, like myself, and the Sahaba. The Sahaba were quote unquote free. I mean, every day was a was a new day, a new uh, journey. I mean, they had time to contemplate, to think, to do business, 
to worship, to uh, exercise, to practice, to deliberate with each other, debate. But us, it's a very set lifestyle. You wake up eight, nine till five, you work traffic and then come back. You have like one hour, you watch YouTube and then you go to sleep. Basically, the lifestyle is very set, whether you're a student or a, or a businessman or, or working, you know, working a nine to five job. And then in, in this set lifestyle doesn't allow you the means to study Arabic. I mean, take take passion in learning Arabic or learning uh, Hadith, Fiqh or anything, even even if you have another passion like painting, you don't have any time to engage in the, the world you have in your head. You don't have the time to build it. What what would your advice be in this instance for Muslim men? I'll say one thing and then open up the floor from there. And that is that we're always engaged in what is important and urgent. And the things that we want to do and should do are in the chart of important but not urgent. So like, let's say working out. Somebody who's not worked out in a while, for him, working out is important, but it's not urgent for me to go to my work, get my paycheck, you know, do this and that in my checklist of life. That's important. And that's the unfulfilling life is where you're always in a state of urgent and important. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the worst is like it's not in urgent and it's not important. And you're playing video games, for example, not to say that it doesn't have its relative some benefit that it may have. I'm not trying to like put anyone down. I'm just giving an example here to make a point. But the things that you have in your mind, I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to work out and I want to learn Arabic and I want to do this. That will be in the chart of important but not urgent. And you're mm. as as your life becomes fulfilling, you want to move from here to as much into to achieve the things that you know are important, but they may not seem urgent. You know, I, I wanted to say, speaking of that, that's an a mashallah, amazing way to frame it. I didn't think about it that way. They always say that if you really want to do something, you you really have to want to do it like, like you want to breathe air, like you're drowning and you're drowning and you want to breathe and you need to somehow trick yourself, trick your brain to feeling that way about your goals, feeling that level of urgency. Otherwise, you may never do it. And it may just always be an important thing in your head. And I've seen this with myself and everybody that we, we need to find a way to trick ourselves to wanting to do, learn Quranic Arabic like it's that life or death mm. and survival. Wanting to work out like it's life or death or survival. That, I think that comes from... And in uh, fact, it is. Yeah. yeah it that is. we value the here and the now more than the, what's going to be happening in the next 20, 30 years. We need to trick ourselves. We need to. We need to find a way to. I'm, I mean, we, I mean, there's many ways to go many about this. To find a way to get. What do you say? For many brothers, it is life and death. How many Muslims have diabetes? How many Muslims have heart attacks? How many Muslims have all these health problems? <laughs> a lot of Muslims <laughs> are going to die. If if they worked out, they eat healthy. They may have an extra twenty years in their life. They may not. It may be giving them an extra twenty years in their life. So it is a life and death thing. Yeah, exactly. But then the other thing about that is humans are always moving away from pain and moving closer. So I see this arrow, this comfort. Yeah, this arrow is going one way. It's moving away from pain and it's moving towards comfort or pleasure. And if you can take conscious awareness of where you are on that, you could say arrow on that one way road, you can then begin to, um, you can say manipulate yourself to doing the right thing. It's all about like, you know, there's a brother who told me, um, you have to negotiate with your ego, ego being shaitan. You got to negotiate with yourself. You know, if you can learn to negotiate with yourself and that comes from rewarding yourself for doing something good or, you know, you're going to get angry at this person, negotiate with with yourself in such a way where, you know what, I know you want to be angry, Kareem. I know you want to be angry, shaitan, but let me do this first. Let, let us give him a few more seconds and then we can be angry at something else or we can reward you for this if we you know what i'm saying negotiating with yourself i mean this is this is what i think we we're missing here is, is learning to manipulate ourselves um to do what we need to do to trick ourselves into thinking it's urgent to do this and it's not urgent to do that that comes from you could say not meditation but it comes from contemplation um reflection on yourself and then the the second point to that is you know when you're when you're constantly in a, in a, in a hamster wheel you're going to school you're working you're you're doing your part in the matrix and you're, you you have no time to think. When you have no time to think, you have no time to take awareness of all these things. And, it, and like Sheikh was saying, you have to have the ability to go out in nature and reflect, to read the Quran, to listen to the Quran, because that will, that will help you begin to gain awareness of these things. And once you gain awareness, then you can start to convince yourself to negotiate with yourself, to trick yourself into feel, uh, feeling the urgency of death the urgency of the Yom of Yom Qiyamah, the day of judgment, 
the urgency of, you know, if I don't get fit, what if, I mean, if I don't get fit, this could affect my marriage. If I don't get fit, this could affect my performance and, and work. I mean, if you really care about your job, you need to be fit. And if you're fit, you have better performance at your job. It's starting to, to be aware and to contemplate these things. And that's a precursor to photo work. Uh, Sheikh, uh, one thing about uh, physical fitness, as Karim was talking, uh, I, I really thought about like what does physical fitness really mean? And I'm just g- going to give you my thought. I mean, it's not like having six packs and like shredded shred city i mean there are many kinds of beautiful bodies you know a man might be bulky but he has a very functional body or a man might be you know he might be more built for aesthetics but i i was really thinking about what is the purpose of physical fitness and uh, what i concluded was that uh, i actually wrote this down a man's physical body should be primed to be perfectly beautiful to show its more beautiful most beautiful form because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and allah created us in an image of beauty and that beauty should should be reflected in our current state so a man's physical appearance or his physical state has three purposes the first is to, sh- to reflect that beauty that allah has put in us The second is to be in harmony with nature. And this, when a man is physically fit, he feels good. And he feels good because he's in harmony with nature. And when he's in harmony with nature, the connection between him and Allah is already strong. You know, the third is to be a functional machine of war. Just in case, (laughs) just in, just in case the evil infiltrates your land, you must defend it from, uh, you, you must defend your nation against it. So that, that is the functional aspect of fitness. And another thing, this might be, but to, for the mutual benefit of your spouse, which is the third purpose. Yes. So I'm not saying uh, to be fit. A man should st- always keep striving to be as fit or as beautiful as possible. Uh, he should always keep striving. Mashallah. Recently, a book was published called uh, Prophetic grappling Hmm. and it's a very beautiful read and i think uh, if anyone ever has doubts on the importance of the physical uh well-being should read this book and see how much i mean imam suyuti at the end uh, one of the last chapters is written by imam suyuti actually he put it in here he quotes hadith after hadith even uh, i'm sure many of you uh have heard of the prophet's wrestling match with the famous wrestler Rusana, right? Hmm. Or Rusana. Um, and, uh, and so the prophet himself was so physically fit that when they saw him in his deathbed, they say that every organ was showing, like that you could tell every organ apart from the other organs. Sure. I mean, this is mentioned in the books of Hadith. It's actually a say Hadith. That every organ was like, like you could tell this organ is separate because of the, the I guess, mu- exercise. Mu- musculature, yeah, the muscle definition. Right? That's, that's extremely impressive for multiple reasons, that when you die, your body becomes bloated and you lose that. Like a person who is muscular, he won't look at anymore after he's, like when he had his death because his bloat will come in. So to have that when you're dead shows just how much it was compared to when you were alive. Yeah. And another so, thing is the prophet... Uh, I mean, we don't know much about his uh, activities before he was uh, 25, but he received prophethood in, uh, uh, when he was 40 years old. Now, 40 is the age nowadays in this matrix, consuming all this processed food, McDonald's. We see people falling apart by 35. I've seen many Muslim brothers. By 35, yes. they're, they're like already gone, yeah. like old belly and everything. But we should remember the prophet, he received prophethood at 40 and all of the battles that he fought were after 40 years old and he was on the front lines and anyone who has done any uh, sport, basketball, anything, it, it, war is the most intense exercise and the prophet was on the front line and he is doing all of this after his 40, not just the prophet, even the sahaba. Or Khaled bin yeah, from that perspective, that's yeah. quite amazing. And this yeah. is when he gets married to most of the wives, right? Yes. Also. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, subhanAllah. And what's interesting, Quran says, Hatta balaga arba'ina sana. Ashudda, meaning man reaches his peak of youth, according to the Quran. The peak of youth is 40. Hmm. 
you know, and that ties in with what Socrates said. Socrates said education doesn't start basically until you're in your 40s, right? Mm. Uh, and so anyway, that's that's a side point. But but obviously there's a certain outlook that you get by the time you're four, you have four decades of experience. Uh, experience in all facets of life yeah. by that time. That uh, So that's when you can say uh, what Quran calls the peak of youth. Mm. So that, and that's so true. People are sick and getting sick and on their downward incline by the yeah. time they're yeah. right? And so subhanAllah for that. SubhanAllah for that. Yeah. You're just getting started at 40. MashaAllah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I think that's a very, I mean, us in our age, Right now, me and Hassan. Meaning, in, in terms of trajectory, the first 20 years are most important. Yeah. yeah. But in, in terms of the ending, uh, the last 20 years, between 40 and 60 are the most important. So I think me, uh, Karim, Hassan, we should, we should have in our head that at 40 will be better than now when we're in our 20s, inshallah. Yes, sir, inshallah. You know, there were fathers at 40 and 50 that were beating up their sons that were 20s. So, I mean, Omar bin Khattab could beat up his son, you know, so. Uh, I mean, you know, my father, my father had me at 40, so. Yeah, mashallah. Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah. Now, mashallah, that's, that's, that's also good. At 19 to be married? Wow. Subhanallah. He was married at 18, had me at 19. Sheikh, I think we should also talk about marriage because for me, when a man is on the dunya, suffering what he has i mean on the mission to build the nation he has in his head and fighting evil fighting disaster he has to have a woman behind him he has to a good woman because the woman is the stabilizer you know when the man is kind of he's he, he feels down or low the woman is you know what completes him you know the feminine energy the exchange of energies between the masculine and feminine but we see that marriage is simply extinct in the Ummah now. And I think Karim, Karim will uh, happily agree with me that for young men, it's very frustrating that, uh, you know, we, because we are abstinent, we, we pledge celibacy till marriage. But it's, it's difficult, you know, because we are trying to be uh, uh, good, strong men. And with being strong men comes the desires. So mm. if a woman is not there behind you, these desires are actually the darkness that can take, take over you, as you were saying. What, what do you think, what do you advise for, like, it's impossible to find, a, you know, marriage within the Ummah right now for young men. What is your advice here? Hello, Mr. There is the first, there are two, three things. Number one, uh, Ikhlaq is most important. Mm. And being anti-feminism is the second most important. So if you find like-minded sisters, and when I started these Telegram programs, the chat and stuff, my intention was not what it became. And now I'm always in a limbo, whether to delete it, not delete it. Mm. But my intent was, okay, people from all around will be here. They can meet up in their local areas and their local cities. Mm -hmm. And they'll be talking about things that we're talking about. But instead it became like a place of argumentation and so on and so forth. So things didn't exactly go the way I planned. And I'm still hoping at some point, once I figure certain things out that I will jump back in and then put in certain rules and then like fix things in, in, in a way that would go in the direction I want. But I just um, haven't really thought everything through yet to be able to do that. Okay. Yeah. But what I was saying is that there has to be some sort of platform where like-minded sisters meet like-minded brothers, where then they can negotiate. And, you know, so the sisters come in. So there's two, there's like one brother I know, I think he's in, Cincinnati or where he is, he will actually go overseas for you to find you a wife that meets your criteria. And you know, of course, you know, you have to pay a fee for the service, but it's not like the online dating thing. It's kind of like he represents, he gets to find out about you. Allah, Allah, Allah. You know, Allah subhanahu wa made wives 
to tell you the problems. Okay. And the job of the guy, guys are goal oriented, as you know. And so the guys find the solutions and the girls, they tell you the problems. This is just how it is. Mm -hmm. So when the girl is nagging or complaining or saying something over and over again, right? Uh, I'll tell you like a funny story that happened between me and my wife um, in the last two days, right? We had a lot of snow here. So the roads, they built a lot of, uh, you know, uh, what is it, the, the, when the road builds a pot where you can like go into, what is it called? Um, you know, so the car is driving and then you fall into a pothole, right? Ditch. Uh, like, yeah. So because of the snow, it, it creates potholes, like ditches or something, right? Mm. So uh, yes, day before yesterday, uh, my son was driving my car. And he fell into, you know, one of the potholes and two of my car's tires blew out. Okay. Mm. It was a really bad ditch. Okay. And Monday, we need two cars. But our family needs two cars because my son has to go to the doctor. And then my wife has to pick up the kids from school. Okay. And it's at the same time. So there's no like practical way around it or something like, I forget what she was saying, something like this, we need two cars. So Friday, this happens, we blow out two tires. So now she's where she's the problem finder, right? She's going to worry about the problem. So starting Friday night, oh, what are we going to do? We don't have, you know, we have only one car. Uh, we have to get the car fixed tomorrow as soon as possible. Okay. And I was at that time doing my Urdu interview with the brother, you know, mm, with Farhan. Yeah, brother Farhan. Okay, so I'm getting text messages from my wife. What What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Okay, you can imagine, you know, conjuring your mind, right? So we finish, and then I go to the I because I that I know the people here. We went, they fixed the car, the two tires, right? And then yesterday, my wife went over the same pot, and she has a V SUV, a big tire, like the car with a big tire, and that tire blew out. So now, <laughs> you know, so I come home. She's like, I have to tell you something. <laughs> and then she's, and then she tells me, you know, I blew out the tire. I said, yeah, my son told me already, but uh, he's like, you can't believe it. You know, Allah did to what Allah did to mom, right? <laughs> kind of like thing. <laughs> she was yelling at us, right? So now, you know, Allah did the same thing uh, to her and her tire blew out. So anyway, the point being that wives will always find problems. This is their job, mm. okay? And you should never get upset with a wife telling you a problem, mm. okay? Because guys live in La La Land and they live like in their own world, you know? Like, you know, this place here, this place here, this is the den mm. of my house. It's like the downstairs of my house, right? Man cave. It's my man cave. It's like where I do my thing. Your La La Land. Yeah, it's my La La Land or it's my Ghare Hira or whatever you want to call it, okay? And, uh, and so my wife never comes here. She cannot step in here for various reasons. We would always end up in a fight because she's going to look at all my books. Okay. So she's, she's not allowed to find flaws in everyone. She's going to find a lot of problems here because this is my area. Okay. So she's just, she, she knows, she knows that coming here was going to create a problem between us. So it's better not to come here. The real point, what am I trying to say is that if it wasn't for a wife, where would I be all day? I'd mm. be right here. Mm. Right. And uh, then I'm not connected to reality anymore. It's the wife that says, hey, we need to pay this bill and we need to fix this. And the roof is leaking or whatever is happening is happening, right? So the wife is like the glue to, to your responsibilities in dunya. So we should never mind our wife. Uh, so, so there is, what is more important is that, uh, how is her ikhlaq? Okay, if there is a sister, she wears niqab, uh, but uh, she uh, has very uh, a lot of anger issues, for example, and that can be possible because uh, you know that because of her upbringing, her father was very angry, so now she's very you know it could be a lot of issues. But in general, the most because when you're marrying a girl, the most important thing you need to look at is that how does that marriage serve you in its capacity? Your purpose. In your purpose, right? Yeah. So even if she's not 
quote unquote, the most spiritual or Sharia compliant being. But if she has the ikhlaq, that marriage will go a lot further in terms of mileage than a sister who wears niqab, but then is maybe doesn't have the ikhlaq that's needed for marriage. So like, for example, I know a lot of sisters who wear niqab, but when they're angry, they don't know how to fight. They fight below the belt. They'll say to their husbands, you're useless. You're like, I've never seen a guy like you. Like, you're the worst thing in my life. Like, you know, you're just fighting completely below, not with rule, right? Isn't that like the stereotypical Arab mom, though? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> the Arabic mom, don't tell me about that one. <laughs> yeah, so because well, I, I look, there's my wife like, is Arab. Oh, really? Yes, <laughs> my wife because is. Arab. I, I've, I've talked to Muslim guys, and they'll tell me how much they love that kind of woman. Though they'll be like, "You don't understand Ooh. how a woman is that kind of like woman who is like a little when she's angry, the entire world is falling apart." There's a lot of Muslim guys who love that. I don't know why, but they love it. There's nothing that could get them better than that. freaks. So you know, my wife is Arab, and uh, she does. You know. She is very energetic and very like, you know, uh, she can, she has a lot of anxiety and, and, and will, you know, say, hey, this needs to be done. And that's her personality. And uh, so, but that's just natural. All women are yeah. going to nag. All women are going to tell the husband this is not right. But what I'm saying is when there's a conflict, there's a way to have a conflict. This is the thing. Right. Sheik, what if the wife is uh, super obsessive and she, she's pointing to problems that don't really exist? Like there are no problems, but she's... No, she's, I do it the other way, okay? If she's saying there's a problem, it exists because it's valid problem for her. So like, for example, as a guy, I would say you're making a small pebble into a mountain. Hmm. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Hmm. That what you see as a small pebble and she's making into a mountain. Why are you making a big deal out of this? But from her perspective or from the perspective of the female, it's a big deal. Right? It has to do with her sense of security. So, for example, I'll give you an example. My son has to be somewhere at 4. She wants me to leave at 3.30. I leave at 4. Okay? Because to me, it's not the most important event in his life. Okay, so he'll be 15 minutes late. They, they give us an hour time before they start their games anyway. Let's say he's going for a soccer match. But for her, the lady that's looking at things from the perspective of nurturing, from the perspective of security, this, you know, from, from the specific perspective a female comes from, or whatever her personal personalities are, uh, that is important to her. So we may say it's not important. When we say, why are you making a small rock into a mountain? We're saying this is not important to me. And why are you making it important for me? Okay. Mm. So a lot of times when they are nitpicking, they're not nitpicking intentionally from the perspective of nitpicking. They're nitpicking from the perspective that uh, that, that is important to them. Mm. And it may not be as important to you. But the whole two things here. Number one, you have to be able to fight in a way that is like a halal fight without backbiting, without uh, ripping each other apart in terms of your ego, your izza, your honor, right? The most important thing to a man is his respect. So if a man feels that every time there's a problem, she immediately jumps into disrespecting me, this is what I mean by ikhlaq, right? The problem is not her bringing a problem to my attention. Right. The problem is that when she feels that there's a problem, then she will dishonor that man as if he's the worst thing in the world. Right. And so you never did this for me. So this kind of like uh, attitude that you're nobody or you're nothing uh, Mm. that shouldn't be there. And you should argue within boundaries. If her tone is eight, your tone should be eight. If your tone is five, she should not take it to eight. She should argue in the same tone or less. Hmm. The husband, for example, she should not, you know, uh, looking at people or talking to them like many times the wives do and many times the husbands do. They'll talk to their spouse like they have contempt for them. Like, I can't believe I married you, like attitude, right? And they will call them names, name calling. This is completely unacceptable in a marriage. Completely unacceptable. Hmm. Completely you know, that- that is uh, I have never like today, and my wife will probably watch this. She knows I've never called her a name. Never. And she has never called me a name. 
like you're this and this and this. Never, you know, we always, whenever we have fights, which is maybe once or twice a week, maybe, uh, whenever we fight, we, we always get over it. We talk it over and uh, I always prove her wrong and then, you know, we move on. <laughs> or she always proves me wrong and we move on. But no, the point being that, um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, that uh, we argue in a negotiated way. And there's no winning or losing. It's just negotiation. Well, subhanAllah. Easier said than done though, yeah. Well, well the thing is, um, I think what I learned from what you just said there, Sheikh, is, well, there's two things. I noticed this in basically every marriage I've seen, if not most of them. And I've also is what to vet for. So we, I always ask myself, what am I going to be vetting for? I think the number one priority is just the reflet. And if they are they dramatic, do they have the creative, you could say the creative ability to come up with insults? Do they, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, like, Sheikh, uh, some, uh, some uh, sisters, mashallah, they look like uh, angels. Like they look the closest thing to a Hora lane. I mean, that's what they look like. But when they speak, <laughs> it's like the devil is speaking. It's like some dark con conjured up thoughts just come out. It's it's crazy. I mean, yeah, you, you know, can... I'm all, I'm 100% for niqab. This is my opinion is niqab. But I've seen a lot of sisters who wear niqab and they look on down on the sisters who don't wear niqab. Even though the one who's not wearing niqab, her ikhlaq is 10 times better yeah, than yeah. what? Yeah. And then not, uh, then the niqab sister, yeah, definitely. But I, I'd say that it, there's a higher correlation though because I've seen women who are modest and usually they are more feminine and kind and usually that's the way it goes. There are some exceptions, but most of the time it's the way it goes. Not, not from what I've seen. And I've been, you know, I'm a teacher of many of these niqabi sisters. It's been around. Um, Sheikh, uh, I've, I've even seen non-hijabi sisters much uh, better in conduct than hijabi and niqabi sisters. I've seen this many, many times. Well, I, many times. I've seen the honestly. Is, so like, for sorry, example, I've like, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example, right? Yeah. People consider me a sheikh, right? So they think that the, my family friends should be only people that follow a certain outlook. Like my wife should be friends only with women that wear niqab, for example, or uh, women that wear only hijab, for example, right? Or like a certain outlook, right? Whatever it is. Or in the same thing with me. But I can't tell my secrets to some of the religious brothers, okay, and expect those to say safe in this community that's very tight knit, then compared to maybe some of the other brothers, that if I tell them a secret, they're gonna actually keep my secret, even though they're not as religious, versus I tell my secret to some of the very close religious people, and they'll tell everybody. Do you know what Sheikh Omar said? Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. So you know, yeah. it's 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 so the most important thing for the function of marriage is ikhlaq. Hmm. Yeah. Second thing is a complete negation of feminism. I, I'd say yes. the reason may be different in my <laughs> area is that in my area, it's been so liberalized that the norm is away from anything that's Islamic. Like mm -hmm. I've been in a place called Plano, Texas. It's famous. If I've heard people from Seattle go, they're like, that's where all the monastics are. They're like, they're the most secularized, horrible people on the face of the earth. And like, it's one of these areas where people just talk like to be considered a Muslim is to act upon Islam, to pray, to do any of these things is considered a bad sign in this community. Where to go higher is to go, is to act like the Quran, and to go lower in their eyes is to act like a Muslim. Like too much sign of religiousness, signs of like following Islam, that'd be looked down upon. So I think in that scenario, like it starts becoming like the people who start following Islam, it's not because they're being rewarded for it, it's because they actually believe it. Yeah, what I've seen is that when people start, there are two types of people starting to follow Islam. One is people that actually start following Islam. And one is because they are programmed because they were raised, right? And so when they were raised, they wore the niqab or they wore the beard or whatever they did, but it didn't change their inside. Yes, so yes, yes, yes. And so that is, you want to wife that, uh, and one thing is that, uh, and no matter, you may, you may marry the best wife, but she's still going to kill the man's ego from time to time. Okay. That's just a given. That's just how the marriage is for that reason. Okay. Did the prophet have a problem with his wives or his wives had a problem with him? 
Mm. Interesting question. Uh, didn't it go? His wife had a problem with him. Okay, so the wife will always. And he's a problem. prophet. And he's a and he's prophet. A prophet. Yeah. So the wife will always, but it's not really a problem. It's just that's how Allah has designed women to be. That's what keeps man on his feet, so to say. Yeah. Right. And so, and when the limits cross certain point, then the prophet said, "Okay, fine. I'm I I'm going to separate myself from all my wives." And that's what that's being part of man, right? Knowing where your limits are, right? Knowing your principles, right? Yes, everyone's becoming rich because we have the ghanima from the spoils of the war. And now the wives are saying, well, don't we get anything? I mean, we were poor, like they were poor, and now they're becoming all rich and we're getting nothing. This is the time where Fatima came for the slave, remember? And the Prophet gave her the tasbih because she, they were hoping that now that we have a little bit more all the families around medina are becoming rich after being very poor like the and the prophet's like nope not for us not for us fatima you can't even have a necklace because you're my daughter the prophet came to the door of fatima and saw a type of necklace thing on her door and he turned back he kept it very strict for his own family very strict no man should be able to say oh muhammad benefited from any of this <laughs> and and sallam, yes and so the point is, is that I can see uh, that, uh, I mean, our mothers did something, subhanAllah, that no, 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 no wife can do, uh, you know, that, that like if, oh, everybody around me is going gonna, is gonna to be prospering and I'm putting in the most effort, right? And I'm not prospering with them. And, uh, and, and I'm telling my wives, no, we're not going to take it. That's not, no wife can accept that. That's just not natural. From a, from a female's, uh, uh, you know. But our mothers made that sacrifice. May Allah reward them. But the point being, what? That women will always point out the problems. The guys are oblivious. Guys are focused. They're like the hunter. They're like the predator, right? We're focused on that one thing we're chasing, mm -hmm. right? And the girls are like the prey. Mm -hmm. their, their periphery vision is much wider, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so uh, if something is not, if, if uh, you know, something is not working at home, I may even know about it, but I, it doesn't matter to me. It has nothing to do with my goals, right? Uh, the paint in this room doesn't look good. Well, I'm never, I don't even, if you ask me outside this room, what's the paint of your room, right? And this is my favorite room, so to say. And you ask me, what's the color of your room paint? I wouldn't know. Mm. Yeah. right but she's gonna come in here and say oh, oh look at the color it's so bad you're doing your videos i mean so many times my wife will watch videos and say like how come you have that in the background i'm like are you watching my video are you watching the background literally the most common phrase of my wife in watching whenever the few times she does watch is that oh what's that in the background what's that in the background mm. so their their view is different from us mm -hmm. And I'm only mentioning my wife, inshallah, as an example, only because I, so that you understand what is the normal, like every wife is going to complain, right? Yeah. Even the prophet's wives complained. And, but the thing is, is that you fight or you argue or you negotiate within certain limits. Mm. Yeah. As long as the woman is... Uh supporting you assisting you in that vision that you that, that you have and she's despite all of the contradictions she might have with you the the big picture is still alive yeah that's what a successful marriage should be inshallah. i mean marriage is a whole conversation but yeah hmm. that's two cents on that issue okay i think sheikh uh, today we should probably end, uh, but uh, we should probably next time we should speak about skill sets. I feel because uh, I don't think the foot, uh, proper way of fatwa is just you know sitting in your room reciting Quran all day. I think we should have a very diverse set of skills. The ideal man, the ideal Muslim man. So perhaps next episode we can start discussing skill sets. What 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 type of skills? What type of study? A Muslim ideal man should pursue, inshallah. 
what disciplines should you engage in, inshallah. 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 Rashi, could you end with a dua, inshallah? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ya sami dua, ya sami dua, ya rahman ar-Rahim, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-ayu al-awdim. Ya Hannanu, Ya Mannan, Ya Badiu al-Samawati, Wa Lawdi Adha al-Jalali wa al-Ikram. Allahu, Allahu, Rabbuna, La, ush- la Nushrik Bihi Shay'a. Allahumma fill lana warhamna, Allahumma fill lana warhamna, Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmatan wa hayya lana min amrina rashada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take all the self-defeated young Muslims who have a religious mind out of their state of being victimized and give them nur in their hearts and the strength to and the persistence to keep fighting the fight with themselves, their egos and shaitan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send sakina upon them and mercy upon them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the marriages of all the Muslims. Allahumma ameen ya rabbal alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Till next time, brothers and sheikhs, assalamu alaikum.